to Starfield game developers held a quick Q&A through the official Bethesda Game Studios Discord server yesterday only for those signed up as Constellation members through their website. They fielded a total of 16 questions from literal hundreds of questions that poured in sometime before, all questions which were asked by excited fans in the community waiting for the next big Bethesda IP. The two developers were lead quest designer Will Shen and lead designer Emil Pagliarulo, who were both seen in the recent Starfield showcase. Question 1 was, can we buy horses or property in the main cities? Will answers, yep, there's housing in different cities that the player can get. Some you have to purchase and some are rewards for specific quests. Emil answered, sure can. You can purchase a dwelling in all the major cities in the game, and there's at least one that you get specifically for completing something. Question 2 was, if we get the kid stuff trait, will our parents be generated based on our character's look? Or are their standard parents put in place? What benefits might there be? Will says that our programmers on their new face tech were excited to make a function that could try to match your custom face and then create the two parents. So they are based on what your character looks like, although the specific math involved is a bit beyond me. We had simpler tech in our previous games. Emil answered, yes, totally, just as we did in Fallout 3 with your dad and Fallout 4 with your son. In Starfield, if you take the kid's stuff trait, your parents are based off of you. No spoilers, but I think the fans will really appreciate the actors we got to play those roles. And they just get so into it. It's awesome. Oh, and yeah, you can get stuff. Question 3 was, for those of us who have never played a BGS game and will be starting with Starfield, what information should we know that will make the experience more impactful from the start? How deep should we go into creating our character's backstory before we start the game? Emil answered that, we always make our games for fans both old and new, so you can jump in without ever having played a Bethesda title before, but we would like to look at it less as playing a game and more about living in the universe we created. So settle in, go at your own pace, and pretty soon you will learn all the systems and be adventuring through the settled systems the way you choose. As for going into a character's backstory, that's entirely up to you. I'm all about that headcanon. For example, my latest character is a working schlub named Mitch Dombrowski. He's a husky, good-natured space trucker, and while he'll do whatever he needs to defend himself, he'll never shoot first. He's like Han Solo's sweeter older brother, and yes, there are traits and backgrounds that support that kind of thing. Will answers, while we do start you off in the same spot, what happened to you before the game starts is totally up to you and your head cannon. There is a trait and background system that let you specify more about yourself, but you can also select a anonymous background and no traits if you want. In terms of if you've never played a BGS game before, try anything. We a simulation as well as a role-playing game, so we try to support the player doing what they want as much as we can. Question 4 was, how will the smuggling cargo system work? Can we hide it somewhere on the ship and sell it for more currency later? Will replies, certain items are considered contraband and you will need to smuggle them past security ships that are in orbit of major settlements. Emil also answered, saying, there are specific items that are considered contraband, meaning they're pretty much illegal everywhere. And yes, you can hide them using the special ship modules you can purchase. So, you know, don't get caught with those harvested organs. The economy is fixed but the prices of bought and sold goods can change based on the skills you choose. Question 5 asked, Will there be a jail system if we commit crimes? Will says yes, you can elect to go to jail or pay a fine when you're arrested, or even resist arrest and try to escape. Emil also says yep, the settled systems is more like Skyrim than Fallout 4's Commonwealth in that regard. You bunch of criminals, there is civilization, there is government, and there are laws, and in a couple cases, we actually explore the themes of crime and punishment in our futuristic universe. Question 6 asks, will time pass when not in the game? For example, will my trade routes, outposts, and mining operations continue to produce, or does that only occur while actively playing? Emil responds, the sim only runs when you're actively playing, no sleeping on the job. Will confirms this by saying, only when actively playing. 
Question 7 inquires, can you be a double agent in the game? For example, if you join the United Colonies, can you also join the Crimson Fleet and give the United Colonies information? And what factions have that feature if they do? Will replies, all of the playable factions can be completed independently. The Criminal Fleet storyline does feature you being an undercover agent inside the fleet on behalf of UC Sistef, a specific military branch of the United Colonies, but whether you betray the fleet or UC Sistef is a choice you'll get to make. Will says that, ha, huh, that exactly what you can do. Infiltrate the Crimson Fleet for UC Sistef. It's specific to that quest line. In the studio, I have been half jokingly accused of referencing movies that some folks have never seen because I'm old. So with this particular plotline, the inspiration was very much the movie Donnie Brasco, which is a true story of an FBI agent who infiltrates the mafia. How far will you go? Question 8 asks, Depending on traits selected during character creation, will it at all be possible to play through the game in a pacifist mode, i.e. without killing anyone or even potentially anything? Will states, I can't guarantee every mission can be completed in pacifist mode, but we do have a couple of systems that will help. One system is our speech challenge game, where you can persuade someone to do something like not fight you. Emil says that Bethesda talked about this very early on during pre-production, whether or not we would fully support a non-lethal playthrough. We realized that for various reasons, that wasn't totally feasible. Now, that being said, there are some good non-lethal options, whether through dialogue or by using a non-lethal weapon. Those can be used in certain situations. Honestly, a lot of situations, though I couldn't comfortably say you can complete the entire game without any killing whatsoever. The settle systems is mostly civilized, but it can be a dangerous place if you're going off the beaten path. And you're absolutely gonna go off the beaten path. Question 9 asks about lore. What are the beliefs and basic history of the religions we can join? Such as the Sanctum Universum, the Enlightened, the Great Serpent. Emil surprisingly states that existing IRL religions are part of the Starfield universe with folks of all religions and denominations out there, but we don't really focus on them. Instead, we highlight three new ones specific to the game. Will follows up saying that the Sanctum Universum is only a couple decades old in our timeline, but has gained a lot of prominence. They believe that God is out there somewhere in the universe and that humanity's ability to travel to stars brings us closer to God. Emil expands on the Sanctum Universum, explaining that the members called Universals believe that God very much exists somewhere in the universe, that a higher power is guiding us all. Specifically, they believe that humanity's ability to travel the universe and grab jump is God's way of saying, I'm out here, come find me. Will goes on to explain another group called the Enlightened, an atheist group that focuses on humanitarian and community work. They believe that life is something every person has to take responsibility for, so that if we want the world to be a better place, we have to do it. Emil then gets into explaining the Enlightened even more, along with another religion. The Enlightened. These folks are essentially organized atheists. They don't believe in any kind of higher power. Rather, they teach that human beings have to take care of each other, and they practice what they preach through various community outreach programs. House Varun. Oh boy. So in the game, you're not really sure what the complete truth is, but the gossip among the guards is this. A colony ship sets off for a new world, making grab jumps along the way. After one of the grab jumps, one of the passengers claims he spent that time communing with a celestial entity known as a Great Serpent. What was a few seconds for everyone else was much longer for him, and he brought back a mandate, which is basically get on board or be devoured when the Great Serpent encircles the universe. Is it true? I ain't saying. So in the game, you sometimes face off against House Varun Zealots as an enemy group, and that's their motivation. I recently got the House Varun logo tattooed on my wrist, so yeah, I dig them. Question 10 asks, how many companions will we be able to recruit? Will and Emil both confirm that there are over 20 named characters who can join your crew, and we're really focused on the members of Constellation. Four of them are from Constellation and have the most story and interaction with the player, but all of the named characters have their own backgrounds and can follow you around and carry your stuff. Emil further states, when we first began Starfield pre-production, we looked back at our previous games and realized how popular and effective the companions were, so they were quite a big priority for us and we really wanted Titan directly to the main quest. 
There are some really big moments with them specifically. I should also mention that our companion voice cast is amazing. We haven't released a list yet, but you can be sure there are a lot of ta talented actors bringing those characters to life. Same for Constellation in general. Question 11 asks, when we assign crew members to work at Outposts, do we have to pay them salaries? Emil answers that you just have to pay them once. We actually experimented with paying them regular salaries, but ultimately decided to just have the one cost up front. There's a lot to do in Starfield, and we wanted to minimize what the player had to constantly keep track of. Will follows up with Emil's answer saying that, yep, one-time payment that you can use a speech challenge game to negotiate over. Some traits also affect the cost. Question 12 asks, Will our companions be able to level up their perks? Will their perks stack with ours? Will says that all crews start with a set of skills at specific ranks. So you might meet a character that's especially good at rifles and you hire them to watch your back. Or you might meet an astrodynamics expert that will increase your grab jump range when assigned to your ship. Emil explains that companions don't level up, but they come at different ranks depending on the companion. Well, we call them skills in Starfield and they do stack with yours when relevant. Some are there for flavor, to highlight the companion's backgrounds and interests, but you'll really feel the benefit of the ship and combat related ones. Getting a boost to your shields or seeing your companion laying down fire with a weapon they're proficient in are pretty sweet moments. Question 13 asks both de developers, what are your favorite parts of the game? Will answers saying, I love finding content I haven't seen yet or forgot about. Our games are so big that no one person is likely to have seen it all, even after all our passes and levels of review. Our quests really evolve over development and it's great to see how everyone adds to them. Designers, animators, voice actors, lighting, everything. Funnily enough, after Will said this, Emil states, Because of my position, my experience is a little bit different than yours. I won't speak for Will, but personally, I've seen every quest line, every city, every major piece of content in the game at every stage of development. So my answer is colored by that. For me, the real pleasure is seeing how they've all evolved into the versions they are today, the versions everyone here will play. I have a real soft spot for Neon, getting that city nailed down took a lot of work by a lot of different people. And the result is, really, the cyberpunk settlement I always hoped it would be. I also love all the quest lines. I think they're the best we've ever done. The designers on this project totally killed it. Question 14 asks, what books or movies had a big influence on some of the quests? Will says that he's a history nerd, so I actually listen to a lot of podcasts like Hardcore History and The History of Rome. While our game is science fiction, I like how historians can tell you about how human beings react to extreme circumstances like war, famine, and technological breakthroughs. You can imagine how we'd react to similar circumstances in the fictional setting, just at a grander scale. Emil says that I'm a child of the late 70s to early 80s, and I have very fond memories of the sci-fi of that time. Star Wars, OG Battlestar Galactica, Space 1999, Buck Rogers, Battle Beyond the Stars, Ice Pirates, and let's not forget the classic that is Metal Storm, The Destruction of Jared Sin. I think I actually saw that one in 3D, but also much heavier sci-fi stuff like the writings of Arthur C. Clarke and Robert Heinlein, or films like Contact, Interstellar, 2001 A Space Odyssey, and even Event Horizon. In all of those examples, you realize that outer space is two things. One, a source of mystery and wonder, sometimes terror, and two, a giant blank page on which you can write any story, and we have written a lot of very different stories in Starfield. Question 15 asks, what are some of favorite small details in Starfield to add to the immersion? Emil responds, I think what I really love is that although humans are living in space and our aesthetic is very much NASA punk, this is a very lived in universe and you can see it everywhere. You know, everyone loves the sandwiches, but it's the books that are lying around, the notes on bulletin boards, the environmental storytelling that our level designers and world artists are so good at. Totally love the work from our voice actors too, and the music and sound effects and clothes, buttons. We do love our buttons. Oh, I do want to mention this, if you haven't heard about it, Adam Savage and team are building a filming model of the Frontier. Will Furter goes on to say, I look really closely at all our outfits. You can see seams, materials, especially on these spacesuits. Constellation members also have patches on their spacesuits and they're tied to what skills they have. We also love buttons. There's a lot of buttons. The last question asks, what is the history of the mechs? Emil chimes in here while Will stays silent. Oh, the mechs. Good one. 
so we showed this a bit in one of the animated shorts. The mechs are leftovers from the Colony Wars. Note it's Colony War and not Colony Wars, singular. Both sides, United Colonies and Freestar Collective, had mechs, but the Freestar Collective really mastered them. The United Colonies had mechs too, but they also relied on the controlled alien beasts from their Xeno Warfare division. Both of those were outlawed with the armistice that ended the Colony War. I'm not saying there's an old mech battleground in the game, I'm typing it. Mechs, not usable, no, they're in ruins. And that's it. I really enjoyed this Q&A session with the devs. It's clear that a lot of thought and passion went into Starfield, and it only heightens the anticipation for the game that's now gone gold, meaning it's ready for not just preloading, but also for actually launching instead of being delayed unexpectedly yet again. If you want to keep up with everything Starfield, definitely subscribe to the channel so you and I can explore the game together.